Junk Food Dinner 322. It's the first week of our 10-week romp through time. 1920, here we come. First, witches and demons have always walked among us, or have they? In Haxon, witchcraft through the ages. Next, a slacker monkey makes his way in the American frontier in Go West. Finally, a day in the lives of Soviet Russians in The Man with the Movie Camera. We were provoked by the devil. Welcome back to the Junk Fa Diner. The next movie on 20s week is Go West from 1923. It is directed by Len Powers, who also did The Knockout and uh, North of 5050, some other old Z movies. This is a movie that uh, Mark Fredo told me about a-, a long, long time ago. He said I would love it. And uh, he was right. It's a movie that concerns... Monkeys in the Old West. The entire cast is monkeys. They're cowboys and their horses are goats. And all <laughs> of that shit is right up my alley. So, uh, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, I saw this a long time ago and, uh, it's not necessarily something I would normally pick for the junk food dinner because it's only 12 minutes long. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I decided to go for it for 20s week. There are a couple other 20s movies I wanted to do, uh, like Caligari, things like that. But, yeah, you know, some stuff like that. But I decided to go with this because, A, I thought that may- there was a chance I would lose my mind watching three full-length 20s movies. And, B, yeah. be- like, it's it's 40% that and 60% that I just think this is, like, a legitimately rad movie that uh, I think could probably only exist in the 20s. And, you know, there's no, like, 2016 equivalent to this aside from, like, maybe Monkey Up. Or, uh, Russell. Oh, yeah, Madness. Most Valuable Primate. Most Valuable Primate. I mean, yeah, like, those movies like that exist now, but, uh, there's no f- 100% monkey movies, I don't think. And these monkeys, uh, I'm sure Sean will talk about it, but uh, these monkeys were probably hurt badly <laughs> during the course <laughs> of making these movies. So I think that's, that's uh, what we like to call monkey torture. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's that. Um, let's see. Uh, the, there's a, a young man monkey who lives like on the farm or whatever with his parents. Uh, he's graduated from college. I'm not sure which college because he has like Yale and Harvard and Polytechnic. He has so many pedants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Polytechnic. <laughs> yeah. Poly- which, uh, what the hell is that? <laughs> a lot of different pedants. I'm not sure where he graduated from or, or, uh, how his parents who like just like live on a farm or something even afforded to send him to all these schools, but. It was he's, a different he's just a big fan of the college system. That's it. <laughs> he just likes yeah. college in general. This is back in the days when you could go to college for a couple bucks, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. going to do a couple years at Yale, do a few at Harvard. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, his name's Jefferson, if I remember correctly. His dad gets sick of him. His hard drinking and his, uh, like, boozing around, coming in late and sleeping all day. So, he kicks him out of the house. He was the original college party animal. That was the tagline. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. All all of the like college party movies we've talked about, Revenge of the Nerds, and like Porky's and stuff like that. It all goes back to this one movie. This is the movie that started yeah. it all. Spud McKenzie cites this film as a huge influence on his career. Yeah, that's true. And Slurms McKenzie as well. Uh, um, so so yeah. So he leaves home. He rides the rails for a little bit. He smokes while riding on a train. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he gives the conductor a dollar to let him ke- keep going. Uh, he gets off in a little town, causes some ruckus. He steals a goat, <laughs> he gets thrown in jail. Um, so yeah, so like it, it's, this movie rules, like I said, because all the characters are, are monkeys. They're all very cute. They're all wearing little clothes, like little men. They're wearing like little leather shoes. Uh, like the, the sets are really great. I think like they, they all, they look like they're in little tiny houses and riding around on little tiny trains and they got a little tiny old Western town and, uh, with little tiny shops and it's all really fucking cute. 
and uh, I love it all. Like the attention to, I mean, it's you know, they didn't have to make a whole lot of sets or anything. Like just like a little, you know, like the kind of little tiny town you would see in your mall or something like at Christmas when they make those little tiny towns that you walk through. Like it's something like that for these little monkeys. And uh, I think it's super cute. There's one monkey who owns a shop that I think looks like me. He's got uh, <laughs> little black glasses and they glued a beard on his face, which is probably unethical. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I really like that character. Uh, I, you know, at one point they're, they're doing like a, a goat chase and they, they're like out in the open on like some old trails in the middle of the woods. And I think that stuff looks really cool. Uh, so yeah, I think this movie is like super cute. I think it's like legitimately great. It's not just great because it's monkeys dressed like little people, which is something I like, but I think it's like a cool piece of art for its time. You know, like I said, this could only exist in 1923. Uh, now if you're, if, you know, Universal announced that they were going to do a movie with all monkeys, uh, riding goats around, being attacked by the sheriff who's played by a dog. Uh, PETA would probably get them shut down pretty quick. Uh, so I think this is super cool as a historical thing and as a thing to watch. What do you guys think about Go West? Yeah, you know, I, I think that this is super cute. Um, I think it does qualify as a piece of art. Um, it, it does make you wonder, though, like, it, is there a wang wang factor behind this? And I guess we'll we'll get into that a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I saw this, um, I guess, a few years ago when you got kind of obsessed with it, when uh, Fredo sent it to you and... Uh, I, th- I think Kevin watched it at that time as well, and, and we were all, uh, you know, infatuated with it. Um, I would like to see more of these. I did dig up um, north of fifty fifty on YouTube, but I haven't had the the nine minutes or whatever yet to watch it. But I'm, I'm sure that I will. I'm sure that I'll get to that. <laughs> um, I think this Len Powers guy pretty much only directed these dippy doodads things. Uh, I looked into a few of the other titles that he had on his IMDb, and they all seem to be animal related. Uh, so that's kind of interesting that he, that he had this little niche, um, career within Hal Roach studios. Um, and you know, I think Hal Roach studios is kind of an interesting footnote, um, in film history these days, uh, that maybe not a lot of people know about and, and should, um, Hal Roach was a, a pretty notable, uh, producer in this time, you know, in the twenties, he was really one of the Kings of Hollywood. Um, yeah, he was Laurel a, and Hardy. Yeah, very close friends with uh, Laurel and Hardy, very close friends with Harold Lloyd, who did um, Safety Last is probably his, his most well-known movie. But th- those were all Hal Roach-produced uh, features. Yeah, Little uh, Rascals. He, Little Rascals, yeah, Our, our Gang. Um, Will Rogers worked with him a, a bunch, Harry Langdon. Um, all these you know, uh, pretty well-known um, comedians, comic actors of the time all came through Roach Studios. Uh, not to mention Joe's apartment uh, was also filmed at Roach Studios. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, honestly though, you know what one of the last things uh, done through Hal Roach was? No, the the son of a bitch lived to be a hundred years old, yeah. and uh, uh, one of the last things he did, Kids Incorporated. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, but he, yeah, wow, that's cool. Yeah, the guy had such a long career, such a long life. Um, he really actually, if you've been to Los Angeles and you've been to the Culver City neighborhood of Los Angeles or even just heard of it, uh, that whole area was pretty much developed by him. Like it was pretty much empty when he showed up in 1919 and built his studio there. Uh, and it was a major fixture in Los Angeles uh, all the way up until 63 when it was taken down. Um, his studio library changed hands in 1971. Um, and in 1983, he was one of the first guys to uh, experiment with colorization. Actually, not him directly, but the new owners of his library also bought up a 50% interest in Colorization Inc. and started to colorize a bunch of his uh, Laurel and Hardy features. Uh, they colorized Night of the Living Dead at that time. Uh, so kind of interesting that, that he was also tied up in that big uh, colorization uh, controversy that was occurring in the, in the 1980s. But yeah, he had a, a really interesting long life, um, including a, a 1937 business venture with the uh, the son of Mussolini that fell apart uh, pretty quickly. So yeah, weird guy, um, very funny guy. There's an interview with him in 1992 uh, on Jay Leno's Tonight Show that you can find on YouTube where he's 100 years old and uh, still sharp as a whip. Like He does this bit where he demands to be paid for his interview before he starts talking to Leno. That's really funny. Uh, so check that out. But um, yeah, cool guy. So it was cool to see one of uh, one of his lesser known productions here, uh, because I think that these days, these dippy doodads um, are really not known. Uh, it was cool that Fredo uh, found this in whatever 
weird Fredo corner that he finds all these uh, strange films because uh, I hadn't heard of this. I, I didn't know about these. I guess they made a bunch of them, um, like a dozen or so, and, and uh, it seems like a lot of them didn't survive. But I would be interested to see more of these because I think they're fun. Um, in terms of like the Wang Wang factor, in terms of this being like abusive, like I don't know. I, I tried to look into it a little bit, and the only other like reference point that I had for like a movie movie that I knew had like a lot of animal abuse in it would be um, the Adventures of Milo and Otis. Right. Which I, was a movie that I, I really loved as a kid, and then I, I later heard that they like killed a million cats while making it. That they were like throwing <laughs> cats off cliffs left and right to try and make it. And then I looked into that this week, you know, um, <laughs> for the show, and I I found out, you know, like there's a bunch of like r- like random people insinuating that that happened, but very little like actual journalism that suggests that there was any uh, animal cruelty on Milo and Otis. So I couldn't even really confirm. Uh, definitively or not, that Milo and Otis contained real animal cruelty. And then in terms of this movie, yeah, there's a few people that insinuate it. And when you look at things on screen, is it cool to give a monkey a cigarette? Well, it's cool, but it's probably not healthy for him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it cool to, to put a beard on him? It, it looks cool, but again, probably not so healthy. Um, is it cool it, to tie a monkey to a goat? <laughs> That's yeah. absolutely cool. That's that's the best sequence in the movies is, is the goat chase in terms of yeah I, it, all to, cinematic goat chases. And to be fair, I mean, even in today's world, there is that whiplash, that monkey that rides a dog, and they still have him all over the place. Like mm-hmm. he performs oh, sure, at like yeah. halftime shows at football games and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and there's there's a skateboarding bulldog in Venice Beach, California. There's all kinds of animals doing tricks. And some of this stuff, uh, I'm sure that they could achieve without abusing animals. Maybe others they had to. I don't know. Honestly, at this point, uh, considering the fact that I can't watch Wang Wang movies anymore and feel good about it, and I used to love that, I don't want to know. Like if, if somebody mm-hmm. did something fucked up in 1923 to this monkey... I'm going to turn a blind eye this one time. Yeah. I'm willing to be, to be the bad guy. All the monkeys and the people involved in this movie are long dead, so who cares? Yeah, Exactly. We can just, it was a different time, like in a very literal sense. It was a different time. Yeah. Uh, this is before the Humane Society was even involved in films. We can chalk it up to boys will be boys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Actually, kind of interesting that we mentioned um, the Hayes Code before, because that's kind of tied up in this Um the Humane Society started uh, covering film productions in 1940. Uh, there's like an interesting blurb on their website about like why they got into it. I guess there was a 1939 Jesse James movie uh, where they like um, they killed a horse, like a, a horse uh, had to go over a cliff for one scene, and they just did it for real. Uh, and so the Humane Society was like, "What the fuck? Like we can't let this happen anymore." <laughs> so they actually lobbied the Hayes office. Uh, who was in, in control of the censorship of films uh, to allow them to exert control on the animals used in films. So they actually got in through the Hayes office. And then in 1966, when the Hayes Code was overturned, uh, the Humane Society lost their oversight of film production. Um, and they there's a period there uh, where Westerns in American cinema come back in from 1966 through 1980, where you see a bunch of Westerns, because they can now use trip wires again. Uh, they don't have to really treat the horses properly, I guess. <laughs> um, and then I, it's really funny to see on the human, AmericanHumane.org, they specifically go out to cite uh, Michael Cimino's, uh, rest in peace, uh, Heaven's Gate, as the reason for their reintroduction, saying, quote, the film made it apparent to both the industry and the movie-going public that our monitoring oversight was essential. So I thought it was interesting that it was like, oh man, Heaven's Gate happened. We we, we can't we can't turn a blind eye to this anymore. <laughs> we we got to get in there. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, just just enjoy this movie. Maybe some animals got hurt in it. They, they probably did. Um, but I mean, especially after the hell that our nation is going through this week, like <laughs> you really want to worry about some monkeys in the twenties? Just fucking grow up already. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, like you, um, I saw this movie back when we we all got first introduced to it, um, and yeah, it's you know an interesting curiosity. There are, like you mentioned, a lot of these dippy doodads out there um, from this time, from the same uh, people from from the Len Powers and the uh, 
in the Hal Roach studios. Uh, you can see dogs playing pianos and violins in movies. You can see uh, monkeys dressed up like cowboys and, and all kinds of stuff. But yeah, I, you know, this is kind of a cute little curiosity from this time frame. Um, you know, as far as storyline goes, it, it, you know, it, it actually does kind of feel in line with like a lot of those old Laurel and Hardy kind of things where just a lot of sight gags and um, you know, there's really not so much story to speak of. It was meant just as like sight gags and slapstick and like, Oh, look at a monkey. He's dressed like a cowboy or this monkey smoking a cigarette. He's riding the rails. He's, he's, he thinks he's people. Uh, So there's a lot of that going on. Uh, I do like the fact though, that it is like an all animal cast and you know, it's kind of in this weird little world where they had to build these little, you know, saloons and these little Western towns and even like these miniature trains on tracks, which I thought was pretty cool. So yeah, there's stuff in here that's uh, interesting. And for, you know, it's like you said, it's, it's 11 minutes, 12 minutes. You're not going to waste a lot of time. So it, if you're looking for just kind of a cool curiosity and something that has, uh, you know, little monkeys dressed like cowboys it's <laughs> it's a fun watch uh but it does have some interesting history to it and uh, you know i'm glad we kind of dug into that a little bit and talked about the uh the the stuff that was surrounding it at this time because yeah it's uh it's interesting but yeah if you're uh if you're interested i, I think most of these dippy doo dads uh which is the i think the the name of the collection of animal actors uh because you know let's give them some dignity Give them a nice name like that, <laughs> since we're already you know, stripping them of all dignity by making them wear clothes. Um, I think a lot of those are are available on YouTube. So yeah, just just YouTube Dippy Doo Dad, you'll find them. Yeah, they're out, it's the best thing to type in. It's like the funnest phrase to type in, and then you're rewarded with monkeys wearing clothes. So it's win win. It'll be the best day of your life when you discover these guys. So. Yeah, it's one of the few search terms that JFD can recommend that won't put you on a watch list. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. That's true. And one of the few websites we can tell you to go to to watch the movies that we recommend without putting you on a watch list. Oh, uh, did you guys not watch this on streamanimaltorture.net? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I watched this on streamhentai.net, the same place I watch all the movies we talk about. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that wraps it up for Go West, a classic film that rules super hard. We are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk to you about, like, gears and streets walking candles and boobs and boobs. Thanks for visiting the JFD Video Store. We hope you enjoyed our burning hot takes on this week's selected movie. Check us out on iTunes or JunkFoodDinner.com for full episodes. The audio version contains three full-length reviews per week, topical news segments, and listener feedback. Great for long commutes, exercise, or surviving the impending apocalypse. Thanks to Chuck Linnington for the on-screen artwork. Email jfdpodcast at gmail.com or check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr or whatever else is going on. We're probably there and wanna hear from you. Until next time, keep washing them dishes.